All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our third and final screencast for Chapter 9. And remember that we were breaking Chapter 9 down into three videos because there are three steps to cell respiration. And so far what we've done is we've discussed glycolysis, which was the um, very first step in cell respiration. And the second video focused on the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, and that was video number two. And so today what we're going to do is we are going to finish chapter 9 up talking about the electron transport chain, also known as oxidative phosphorylation. And what we also need to do at the very end of the video is discuss something called fermentation. Sometimes there are organisms in our environment that do not have access to O2, and so they need to have a way to generate ATP as well, and fermentation is going to be the process that they're going to use. So that's going to be towards the end of the video. So following glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we need to remember that there were two different types of electron carriers that were actually produced during these processes. Um, NADH was the um, electron carrier that was produced during the glycolysis step as well as the citric acid cycle step as well, again also known as Krebs. And remember there was also some NADH that was actually produced during that preparatory stage between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. And then we had a brand new electron carrier called FADH2 that was produced during the citric acid cycle as well. And remember that these two things were going to carry electrons to the electron transport chain, which is what we're going to talk about today. So these two electron carriers, again, are going to donate electrons to the electron transport chain, and that's going to power um, ATP synthesis. So remember, we're trying to produce ATP, and the bulk of the ATP is going to be produced during this third step. And we're going to produce the ATP via something called oxidative phosphorylation, which is simply using oxygen to transfer those phosphates to the ADP to produce ATP. So the electrons are going to be transferred from NADH or FADH2, again, to the electron transport chain. And you can see the chain represented over here on the right. And the electrons are going to be passed through a number of different types of proteins. And these proteins are identified by number one, number two, number three, and number four. And all of these proteins are embedded within the inner mitochondrial membrane. Most of the proteins, especially the larger ones that you see here, are going to be relatively stationary. In other words, they can't move through that membrane too much, but there are going to be a couple of um, proteins that are going to be what we consider migratory, which means they can actually move through the phospholipid bilayer of that membrane. And there's also going to be some proteins that we identify as cytochromes, each with an iron atom. Not that you necessarily need to know that, but um, it does sort of identify these types of proteins. Now, all of these um, electrons that are passing through these different proteins are trying to find their way to O2, and that's going to be considered the final electron acceptor. And that O2 is going to be used to help generate um, a little bit of water at the very end of the process. Now what we need to remember is the electron transport chain does not generate the actual ATP. It's actually going to be a protein at the very end that's going to be responsible for generating that ATP. Now we have something called the chemiosmosis, and that is going to be considered an energy coupling mechanism. So basically, um, the process that we're going to see over here on the right is going to be coupled with the production of the ATP molecule that you see down here towards the bottom. So the electron transfer in the electron transport chain is going to cause the proteins to pump um, excess H pluses, or these protons, from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. So if you remember during our discussion about the mitochondria, and if you remember the structure, so this was considered the outer mitochondrial membrane, and then what we had is we had this right inside the mitochondria, and this kind of convoluted, kind of twisty um, structure in here. This is considered the inner mitochondrial membrane. And then in here, and if I change the color a bit, right through here, this is going to be considered the matrix of this mitochondria. And remember that in the matrix is actually where um, the Krebs cycle occurred. So this inner membrane space in this mitochondrial matrix kind of gives you sort of an idea as to where things are taking place. Um, this membrane right through here is actually considered the cristate or the inner mitochondrial membrane. So that's what you're noticing right here in black. The space that you see here that's going to be right outside of that membrane, and again, the matrix is what you see in red, and that's going to be right inside of the membrane. So what's going to happen is, as we accumulate these H pluses on the outside in this intermembrane space, 
they're actually going to pass through this special protein that you see right here. And again, this is towards the very end of the um, um, oxidative phosphorylation process or the electron transport chain process. This particular protein is called ATP synthase, and it's going to take these protons, which is what is represented by these um, kind of gray spheres that you see right here. You can kind of see one identified here. But as they make their way through, that's going to allow the addition of a phosphate onto this ADP, which is going to allow us to create the ATP during this third stage of cell respiration. So again, this is going to be used to um, basically drive phosphorylation of the ATP, in other words, moving that phosphate to the ADP. And this is considered an exergonic flow of, um, of these protons. So in other words, exergonic basically means the release of energy, and the release of that energy helps to turn um, the rotor piece of this protein, which helps to pump those protons back across, those H plus ions back across to be able to produce the ATP. So this is a good example of chemiosmosis. In other words, the use of energy in an H plus gradient to drive cellular work. Now we didn't really discuss the idea of a gradient though, and I'm going to back up just really quick. One thing to realize, and we're going to talk about this again as we go into the next slide, but as you notice in this diagram, we have a lot of H pluses here, but not so many over here. So the big thing here is that they're going to move basically according to their gradient, which when we talked about um, cell transport, we talked about things moving down their gradients. In other words, you have a lot of H pluses on the outside, but not too many on the inside. And so that's why they naturally tend to flow through this particular enzyme, which is their only way to get back into the matrix. And again, since it's exergonic, it's going to release a little bit of energy as it makes its way through to be able to produce the ATP that you see down here towards the bottom. So again, the energy that's going to be stored in the H plus gradient, again, the gradient being represented right out here across the membrane, is going to couple um, the redox reactions of the electron transport chain to create ATP, in other words, to synthesize ATP. Now sometimes they will refer to this gradient as a proton motive force. In other words, the ability to sort of push its way through the ATP synthase to do the work necessary to produce the ATP. Now in this diagram, again, this is kind of everything um, that you would find in the third step kind of wrapped up into one diagram. So starting over here on the far left, again, what you notice down here is you notice these are our electron carriers. We have NADH and FADH2. Remember, these came from glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. And these are carrying these high energy electrons. So what's going to happen is as they release these electrons, it's going to bump this NADH back down to NAD+, and that NAD+, can actually travel back to glycolysis or back to Krebs um, to be able to pick up another electron and another H proton. But as you release that electron, it's going to start making its way through these different proteins. And the same thing happens here with the FADH2. It only starts at a different step in the electron transport chain. And so as you release these um, electrons and as you release this energy and it makes its way through these different proteins, you're going to notice there's going to be H pluses that are being also taken off. These are going to be pumped back through these proteins to this inner mitochondrial space right out here. Remember, this is the matrix, and this is the um, inner mitochondrial space. And remember, this is the Chris day. This is where the electron transport chain was happening. But these H pluses are going to collect out here in this inner mitochondrial space. And then what's going to happen is, as they make their way back through um, this particular protein, which again, remember, is ATP synthase, that's going to cause this protein to rotate and as it rotates, phosphorylation is going to occur, which is basically the adding of the phosphate onto ADP, and that's going to generate the ATP that's being produced during this process. Remember, this particular step is chemiosmosis. Now, something we didn't talk about in the previous screen, which is something we need to touch on in this one, is there is some water that's being produced. Now, remember, this is oxidative phosphorylation, which means it cannot happen without the um, help of oxygen. So if you notice, we have two H pluses plus a half of an O2. Remember, O2 is a gaseous form of oxygen, but we're only using one of those oxygens, and that's why you see this half. When you take two H pluses and one O2, it's going to generate some water during this process as well. So down here, if you notice, it says oxidative phosphorylation. So this entire process is called oxidative phosphorylation. 
but this process is broken down into two steps. And remember, ATP is only being produced during chemiosmosis, not necessarily during the electron transport chain. So then what you want to think about is the total amount of ATP that's being produced during cell respiration. So we have to account for all of the ATP during all three steps. So during cellular respiration, most of the energy flow is going to be in the sequence that you see below. We're going to start off with our original molecule, which was glucose. And that glucose is going to basically produce NADH, and that NADH is going to find its way over to the electron transport chain. And then in the electron transport chain, we're going to move that energy along those different proteins, and then we're going to have something called that proton motive force. So remember, that's going to be the accumulation of those H plus um, protons. And eventually, because those H plus protons are going to accumulate in that inner mitochondrial space, they're going to make their way back down through ATP synthase, and that's going to help us to basically produce the ATP. So down here towards the bottom, this is the entire um, setup for cell respiration. It definitely includes glycolysis right here in green. The Krebs cycle is going to be what you see in the middle, and this is what we just finished up talking about, oxidative phosphorylation. Here you can account for the um, NADHs that are being produced. You can see there are NADHs, of course, that are traveling not only from glycolysis, but they will travel from the Krebs cycle as well. Do remember that we did have an NADH that was produced during that preparatory stage as well. Um, you can see the intermediate of the acetylcoenzyme A, which was produced right before we started the citric acid cycle. Then you can see these electrons um, basically being carried over to oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis through these electron carriers. And down here towards the bottom, you can see what the total amount of ATP would be um, from all three steps. So remember, during glycolysis, we had a net gain of two ATPs. Four were actually produced. But remember, we only had a net gain of two because two had to go into the process to get it started. We had two ATPs that were produced during the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. Remember that this thing's going to rotate twice because we had two acetylcoenzyme A's to work with, and that's going to produce two ATPs. And then if you notice, it says about 32 to 34 ATPs will be produced in this final stage. So it's going to vary a little bit based on the efficiency of a cell, and that's why it's usually anywhere from 36 to 38 ATPs total being produced during cell respiration. So as I had mentioned at the very beginning of the video, we do need to talk a little bit about something called fermentation. Um, this is going to basically be an anaerobic process, and it's going to enable cells to produce ATP without the use of oxygen. So again, most cellular respiration does require O2 to produce ATP. Glycolysis, remember, can produce ATP with or without O2. So it can be either an aerobic or an anaerobic process. So in this case, if there is an absence of O2, glycolysis is going to couple with something called fermentation or anaerobic respiration to produce the ATP that the organism needs to survive. So anaerobic respiration uses an electron transport chain with an electron acceptor other than O2. So in other words, again, we don't have O2 in the environment to be able to use. For example, they might use something called sulfate to actually produce the ATP that they need. So fermentation is going to use phosphorylation instead of an electron transport chain to generate the ATP. So there are actually two different types of fermentation. We have one called alcoholic fermentation, which is the one that you see over here on the right. Then we have one called the lactic acid form of fermentation, which we're going to look at in the next slide. So fermentation is going to consist of glycolysis. So remember, glycolysis can occur with or without oxygen, plus reactions that are going to be used to regenerate NAD+, which again then can be reused by glycolysis to help produce ATP. Because remember, this is going to be their only method of actually producing ATP. So two common types, as we said, are alcoholic fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. In alcoholic fermentation, the pyruvate, which is produced from the breakdown of the glucose that you see here, is going to be converted to ethanol, which is going to be the um, byproduct from this particular process, in two steps. And there's going to be the release of CO2 during this um, process as well. So over here on the right, as you can see, this is sort of the breakdown of um, alcoholic fermentation. So as we had said, this is going to be the very first step. So you have access to a glucose molecule. That's going to be broken down, just like you had seen in um, aerobic respiration, into two pyruvate molecules. So the, again, these are going to be three carbon molecules. Glucose was six. These are three. There's going to be two of them. 
as we proceed through fermentation to produce the ethanol in alcoholic fermentation, there's going to be an intermediate called 2-acetylaldehyde. And if you notice, during that time, we do get the production of CO2, so we actually do lose one of these carbons, and it becomes a two-carbon compound. Now, as we proceed to the production of the ethanol, you're going to notice that um, the NADH, which was produced during um, glycolysis, is going to release its energy and actually um, become NAD+, which means it's going to be able to bounce back into the process of glycolysis and actually pick up um, that H again. So it's going to be able to be regenerated through the glycolysis process and be used over and over again. So during this time, remember during glycolysis, we did have the production of two ATP molecules net gain um, from the process itself. And so this is where the um, ATP production is actually occurring. It doesn't occur during the fermentation process. It actually occurs during this process. What the fermentation process does is it actually allows us to be able to regenerate that NADH to NAD plus and put it back into the system so we can use it over and over again. So when we think about alcoholic fermentation, of course, we need to think about where would you find a use for that. Um, obviously in the production of alcohol. Um, also you'll find that um, sometimes we will use alcoholic fermentation when it comes down to baking and doing various different types of um, cooking because um, during alcoholic fermentation, again, we get the production of that CO2, which is really important when it comes down to helping um, different types of breads and doughs to rise. And so there's various uses that we can actually um, utilize alcoholic fermentation for. So the second type of fermentation that we're looking at is something called lactic acid fermentation. And this is going to be kind of similar to alcoholic fermentation. In other words, the pyruvate that we um, actually created from that glucose molecule right here um, is going to basically um, go through the same process, but instead of producing alcohol or ethanol at the very end, we're going to produce lactate or lactic acid. And also in this process, if you remember from the previous screen, we had the production of CO2 during alcoholic fermentation, you're not going to see the release of CO2 in this process. So again, lactic acid fermentation is very similar to alcoholic fermentation. We're still trying to get the production of um, the ATP for use by the organisms to do work. And again, you see the NADH is going to lose its um, um, electrons. It's going to be able to pass that NAD plus back into glycolysis so it can be used over again. And um, again, down here you see the byproduct, which is going to be that lactate or lactic acid. Now when it comes down to um, some uses for lactic acid, again, since it's used actually by some organisms such as fungi and bacteria, we can take advantage of that and actually make some cheeses and some yogurts. Now one thing you want to think about when it comes down to um, the idea of lactic acid is that sometimes when we exercise we get something called a lactic acid burn because when we exercise sometimes our body can't keep up and so we kind of um, um, prevent ourselves from having access to O2, at least O2 in a, um, an abundant amount. And so what our cells do is they actually go into survival mode. And what they'll do is they'll go through this lactic acid fermentation process so that lactic acid can actually accumulate in our cells. And until we are able to excrete that lactic acid, we get the pain associated with that lactic acid burn. So what we need to understand is that both processes are going to use glycolysis to oxidize the glucose and any other organic fuels to change them over to pyruvate. The processes that we've talked about have different final electron acceptors and organic molecule, again such as pyruvate or acetylaldehyde in fermentation, and again the electron acceptor in um, normal aerobic cell respiration is going to be O2. So cellular respiration is going to produce approximately 38 ATPs per glucose molecule. So if you're an organism that does not have access to oxygen, then you're going to go through fermentation, of course, but you're only going to be able to produce two ATPs per glucose molecule. So we actually have two different types of anaerobes that we need to mention really quick that actually perform fermentation. Um, one of those is called an obligate anaerobe, and these are going to carry out fermentation or anaerobic respiration and cannot survive in the presence of O2. But then we have some of those that, for example, things like yeast and some bacteria that are called facultative um, anaerobes. And what that means is that they can actually survive and actually go through fermentation, but they could also actually perform cellular respiration if they need to. So in a facultative anaerobe, pyruvate is going to be a fork in what we consider the metabolic road. 
So you actually have two different choices when it comes down to producing that ATP. And so that's going to be considered two alternative catabolic routes in regards to eventually producing the ATP that's necessary to do work. All right, so that's going to finish up our final screencast for Chapter 9. So I hope this information has been very helpful. Please remember to make sure that your screencast study guide has been completed.